So my name is Paul Curry. I am a senior professional officer at ICLI. We are a membership organization that helps local governments think about sustainability and implement sustainability projects. Um, but this presentation and these themes will come out of my other hat, which is a PhD student at Stellenbosch University with the Urban Modeling and Metabolism Assessment Research Team, UMAMA, cities as mothers, nurturers, resources, women as the people who make many decisions about resources in the household. Um, so it's quite rare to be at a, an event where I don't have to give my definition of, of urban metabolism. Um, but my study has taken me into looking at what different types of urban metabolisms you see in cities. Um, but I think. Uh, That's good enough. Um, but I think it's good just to come back to a foundational question. Why are we analyzing metabolisms? And for us, it's to identify high level, so the most impactful. <laughs> it, it's, I'm so happy with that. Can you leave it where, where it was? I want my title there. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, most high level leverage points to shape sustainable resource consumption. Um, and our scope is very much focused on African cities. Um, and when you talk about sustainable in an African context, you're speaking about equity first, about providing resources. So what does that mean when most of the dominant urban metabolism narrative is about resource efficiency? If you're providing resources to people, you are increasing the metabolism. So how do you do, th do that in a resource efficient manner? I'd also like to provide a framing. Um, I think the lesson from today is that we're very eager as South Africans to dive very quickly into the sociopolitical. And I think for our next workshop, maybe that is something to dive straight into. We've touched a lot on industrial ecology. There are three ecologies that make up urban metabolism. Industrial ecology, the what of cities, material flows, stocks, uh, energy flows. We've uh, noted political ecology. This is how society, technology, and nature make each other. The relationship I have with my water tap determines my expectations to get water from that tap. My use of that tap shapes what the infrastructure needs to do to uh, ensure that delivery. Um, and so we make ourselves and lock ourselves into relationships with um, infrastructure systems. This is also where we must think about who is responsible for shaping um, urban metabolisms. So this is where our question of multi-level governance comes in, vertical and horizontal integration of governmental systems. Um, and then finally, something which, hasn't, which has its own talk about urban metabolism, but hasn't really been embedded in our larger point, is urban ecology. And so this is understanding cities as complex socio-ecological systems. Um, so the uh, metaphor that I prefer as uh, urban metabolism is the ecosystem metaphor as opposed to an organism. Um, and that's because it draws direct attention to relationships as the way you maneuver resource flows. This image is my problem statement for my PhD, um, which basically draws those three things out. So here you see the interface between nature uh, and the built environment. It's our responsibility to look after nature to ensure that it continues to service us, that it continues to function in its own right. You see a strip of informal uh, settlements. It's our responsibility, constitutional responsibility and legal mandate to upgrade um, the quality of life of citizens living there. Um, and you also see them living next to a different typology um, of, sorry, a different typology, um, a different urban typology. Uh, and so the third point is obviously throughout cities we consume resources differently. And this is an obvious point to make, but often not captured in the single quantifications of urban metabolism. This is a seven layer framework of urban metabolism uh, suggested by Fernandez, who's a leading metabolic thinker. Um, I quite like it because it also shows how far we've come. You've seen the posters around Cape Town. You've seen us talk about the abundant information that is here. Um, to start with a very simple bulk mass balance, what is the city using in total? Doing an account to see what sectors are using it. Life cycle assessment to do large senses of what the impact of this is. Um, and getting more and more detailed. So 
Unfortunately, with 10 minutes, I'm going to focus sectorially on water um, and on spatial and temporal realities. Um, my PhD got derailed by the water crisis, so I can't share information on the nexus of water, food, energy, and household level, which is what I'm focusing on. Um, but this digression was quite interesting in terms of looking at the people and how they use water. So this is a visual representation of the table that Paul showed in his very first image, which is the water balance of Cape Town. Um, a bit chopped off. But the message to convey here is that actually you can do quite a lot with very minimal data. This is where our water comes from, which is mostly purchased from outside of the, um, which is mostly purchased from outside of the municipal boundaries. Uh, water comes in and is treated and then comes into consumption. Our highest consuming sector is domestic sector, which is 60% of consumption or 40% of total input. Um, something which gets missed in a bulk balance like this um, is how people fit into that. So informal settlements is put up there, but if you, put that by, if you divide that by our most recent population data, it suggests that you're consuming about 38 liters per person per day in an informal dwelling compared to 194 liters per person per day, which is an average domestic across income groups. Um, the image isn't perfect in here, but the usefulness of visualizing it is it also draws attention to where you have accounting mishaps. So the yellow in the top um, reflects unequal accounting. Um, so the idea with something like this is you can see where you might start implementing. I'm sorry, my microphone is going on and off. Can you hear me like this? Yeah. Is that OK? All right, so the first uh, provocation to a lot of my work is we can do a lot with minimal data um, and identify where, to, uh, input, where, where high level interventions might be possible and choose where to start investigating with more detail. But we also need to invest in regularly collecting appropriate detail and thorough resource data to make more technical and robust decision making. Uh, a lot of it already exists. We collect water data for billing, getting proper aggregation tools. Um, but I think we've already spoken about political challenges of doing that um, considerations. The reason why it's valuable, sorry for the blur, the reason why it's valuable is because it gets us to talk about disaggregated um, metabolisms. So this is what Cape Town looks like based on, that's probably the best we get, based on income on the left and density on the right. These, and this is just uh, residents. So, uh, it shows us where the people of Cape Town are. Um, people who are familiar with Cape Town will recognize the strip of the N2. I can't, I can't show the pointer. The strip of the N2, um, where most of our informal settlements are based. Um, we see income based very much in the west and northern parts of um, the built environment, uh, lower income in the middle, and density is based in those lower income areas with the informal settlements, um, with a few uh, to the north, east, and southeast. If we then took, took a look at a metabolic perspective, uh, this is water access, which we would count as having a tap in your yard or your house. Cape Town boasts 100% access, which is true, otherwise we wouldn't have any water-based deaths. Um, but it's a question of whether we consider walking through an informal cell beyond 200 yards to get water um, the same quality of access. Um, to the west and north, we have high access, and where the informal settlements are, we have low access. This would suggest that you can invest in service improved service delivery options in uh, those locations where it's lacking. If you look at aggregate consumption, the denser areas where the more people or where most water is consumed. So as those areas grow, you're going to think about what types of uh, infrastructures you can use for water treatment, water supply um, to support those areas. Yet, when you look at per capita consumption, you're seeing that those areas of low per capita consumption, so the months have management mechanisms aren't necessarily the first protocol, uh, and those can be focused uh, around the periphery. So I'm running quite quickly because I want to go to the next one. But this image is on the wall over there, close to inspection a bit later. Um, this is if we disaggregate over time. So this is a, uh, a diagram of the water crisis, which shows uh, the blue oscillation of our dam levels going down and down. This is contrary to a lot of urban African discourse, which is talking about uh, what's going to happen in Kauteng, which is the slow increasing population that will, uh, in which demand will overtake supply. Here we just lost our supply. Three years of awful rainfall, 
Um, and it gives us this amazing vignette, post hoc, of um, how you can very quickly change your water metabolism. Uh, so we effectively halved it from 1.1 billion liters uh, per day to a 500 liter target, which we hit, I think, in April. Um, and that would be the pink line. What is interesting to me here is the discourse that was going on. So I'm actually cool here. So from the five, from five large news outlets, um, words water and Cape Town brought up discussions of kind of service delivery priorities. Here is where, um, based on our lower rate dam levels, people were talking about drought, particularly related to El Nino, and around, uh, so this was 2015, around beginning mid part of 2016, the word crisis came in. And this starts escalating, and more discussion about it until here is where the um, disaster plan was released um, in October 2017. Here is where uh, day zero becomes an almost utter certainty. The mayor declares that day zero is going to happen, and the mayor declares that day zero is not going to happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's really interesting is, is seeing that these are corollary, these aren't causations. Um, there's a lot of study to work out well, what actually caused people to reduce their use. All of the supply side um, interventions were too late. So, all of this is demand side shaken. Quite a bit from technical reductions, water pressure. Uh, throttling, um, some water meters, which is a much criticized approach, uh, turn off water meters, smart meters. Um, but I think it's undeniable that there was a massive social intervention component. So financial disincentives, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, uh, and this is where you've got a lot of the questions of big P, mayor demanding people to do stuff, and little P, your neighbors demanding you. Uh, sorry, big P, politics, small P, small politics. Um, demanding to change. Um, so the lesson from that is that malleable is actually, that metabolism is actually quite malleable under the right circumstances. We have the metabolism in two years, it took more than eight, 12. Um, so again, crisis is a unique situation, but that's there. Um, I think the time I want to spend on this is out there, but if we mix the two and look at time and space, uh, I took the suburbs of Cape Town and Categorize them by income and density profile, um, and then looked. And this is based, all of this is actually based on open data from Cape Town. Um, so uh, that was a, another meta conversation about the quality of that, which I'm going to now apply false pedigree to and see how it ranks very low. This shows different income category groups, suburbs so by total water consumption and by per capita consumption. And the three things to draw out from here is that actually everyone in Cape Town, or every type of person, individuals excluded, reduce their consumption. That's quite a powerful message. Um, Leslie's point on, on using data as myth busters, um, I think is really valuable. Um, I, okay. So everyone reduced their consumption despite aspersions that the rich weren't producing, the poor were producing. Um, I would suggest or posit that the people who experienced the largest paradigm shift were the higher income groups who switched from consum conspicuous consumption to try and reach these um, 50 liter areas. Um, but the question is whether you can legitimately expect people who are consuming 38 liters a day to reduce and whether we should be pushing that as a message. And that's an important consideration for the final observation, which is the green line, which is mid low income, medium density suburbs are the most important to the aggregate water metabolism. They change their consumption by half a litre each, and that's 1.7 million people who have changed their consumption. So if you want to talk about aggregate impact, they're the people to engage with. But then the question of who in that group are using a sufficient level of water or rain. So to me, all of this is very interesting. I think this is more of a reflection on the reasoning for today, which is open metabolism is very intuitive. But currently, from my opinion, very misaligned with how urban decisions are made and how urban planning takes place. Um, so how does the city think about how to choose projects? How do uh, they think about financing? How do private sector organizations decide what projects are feasible? Um, so this is more of a, this is a critique, but it's also a call to draw in those expertise to start contributing under this banner. Um, we have the tools, we have a global interest in imperative and sustainability, so how can we help align these with municipal functions uh, or business interests? Um, and then I'm going to leave it up to Jack to talk about how we then think about municipal and citizen responsibility towards shaping 
resources. <laughs>